Welcome everybody, and we're going to go ahead and get started with chapter 9 here, and uh, 122. So let's go ahead and get to it. Now some nights I will uh, do both from PowerPoint and from the board, and sometimes I will have a separate video for the lab, and sometimes I will just go ahead and, and look at the lab uh, at the end of these videos, okay? So right now, I'm just going to stick to the lecture material, uh, but these may also include some lab hints. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do, which uh, I guess I can go ahead and um, uh, we can look at that real quick, since I got it pulled up here. If we go to my channel. Sorry, this is just an aside here. Um, I'm also going to timestamp these, and uh, this is something that I wanted to get to a while ago and uh, just have not had the time, but it will look something similar to this, okay? So I'm going to go back and re-watch all of these, and I will then timestamp each one with, you know, uh, I, I would suggest watching it live first, but then if you have to go back later, if you just wanted to get to a certain topic, then uh, I think the timestamps make it a little bit easier, okay? So I just wanted to point that out uh, real quick. All right. So we are going to start with Chapter 9. And, um, you know, we're going to talk about the different logic families, more so than we did in 112. And we're going to look at, uh, you know, what, what the difference of an output from uh, a CMOS chip, you know, the, the output itself, 5 volts or 0 volts or whatever, uh, is not actually 0 or 5, right? I, I think I try to mention that now in 112. That's what we assume. And uh, in 112, we assume 0, 1, on, off, yes, no, true, false, uh, 0 volts, 5 volts. Those are the two voltages, okay? What you're going to find is it's really like 0 to 0 0.8 volts for like TTL. And then, you know, like 2.4 volts to 5 volts. So really, it's not 0 and 5. Okay, and we're going to talk about what the actual voltages are. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk about uh, most specifically these two right here, right? The TTL chips and the CMOS chips. Uh, and then we will talk about ECL, but those are, are um, um, very power consuming, and so they aren't used on circuit boards that often if you're worried about power consumption. Okay, which, you know, most mobile devices and most battery powered devices are worried about how much power they're using. And that's, you know, you'll find that that's probably why they want to use a CMOS chip versus a TTL, because a CMOS chip doesn't require as much voltage to have a high. Uh, and it, you know, it also will operate on um, less power. So if that's something you're concerned about because you're in manufacturing and you want consumers and you want them to buy your gadget or whatever, and you want your battery life to last a long time, um, then that's the kind of stuff that you consider. So we are going to get down into the weeds uh, in, these, in these IC families, okay, these logic families. So you'll find that within each of those main three families, the most commonly used, they're not the only ones, but the main three here, that there are subfamilies within each. And so uh, you may be more concerned about speed and you don't really care about the power and you're willing to have a, a larger power consumption because uh, the chip is cheaper. But maybe you need, you know, maybe power is the big thing that you're worried about and you're not as concerned about the speed. And so you buy one that focuses on this. Uh, maybe you want one that operates on a different voltage or a current level. Um, you know, if this is going to be used in Alaska, you may want a, a, a different type that operates in the better and colder climates. Uh, if it's going to be somewhere in the desert or where it's very hot and dry, uh, you may want to use a different type. Okay, and so those are the kind of things that you can dial in on. Uh, the, the, uh, the holy grail, so to speak, is getting the speed and also using less power, right? Um, what typically happens is there's a, there's, a, there's a triangle, right, or a pyramid. It's really a triangle, okay? On one side is speed, on one side is power, and then the other side is money, right? And so if you want to get faster speed, you have to pay for it. If you want uh, uh, faster, or you want to use less power, then you have to pay for it, right? 
Um, and so if you want them both, you really have to pay for it. So there's always a cost involved. Um, so you don't just get something for nothing, all right? But, you know, obviously, if you're building a children's toy that just turns on and, you know, I always use that example in 112. If you just have a kid's toy that turns on and just chews up batteries and, you know, nobody's worried about, you know, keeping the thing longer than a couple years probably before they sell it or give it to somebody else or it gets broken, um, you know, then that, you know, you know you're not going to worry about this kind of thing, right? You don't care about speed. The thing just blinks lights and make no makes noise. So, and it says there's standardized numbering schemes, but prefixes may differ. And so like for the TTL chips, they're all, most of them are all like 7400 series. So you could have 7402 or a 7408, whatever. CMOS are typically in the 4000s. So you could have like a 4001. Um, but CMOS also makes a line that will directly correspond with a TTL, right? So they have a different pinout, the 4000 series and the 7400 series for the TTL. They have different uh, footprints on a printed circuit board. Uh, the CMOS has a couple of more pins than the TTL, but CMOS also has a subfamily that only has 14 pins on it and it will directly replace a TTL. So if you wanted to change out your TTL chip for a CMOS, there's a subfamily within the CMOS that allow you to do that, okay? So let's talk about the TTL first. Now, some of you may have already learned about transistors. Uh, if, you've, if you've taken 121, uh, which I don't know anybody in here that's taken 121, but anyway, that, that class focuses more on the electronic components. And so, you know, like op amps and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So... Uh, transistors are one of the things you talk about, the bipolar junction transistor. And um, so these are usually called BJTs, bipolar junction transistor. And uh, they come in the form of MPN or PNP, just depending on how this is set up. P material, N type material. Uh, this isn't all, you know, I, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the, you know, how transistors work because at the end of the day, we're using them in digital logic to turn things on and off. That's all we're doing. We're, it's essentially an electric switch. So, uh, but if you know about the structure of a transistor, right, um, you know, this PN junction, the, the PN junction of a silicon diode is almost no different, right? It's just now you have a P, an n-type material on the other side and it's a three-leg device, right? But essentially what you're doing is you're, if there is sufficient current on the base, it will create a short between C and E, and then you can have current flow in that direction. And you'll see that the way that we stack these on top of each other in different configurations, we'll turn different bases on at different times, and then uh, the chip can operate either by giving out a signal or by sinking a signal back in through the pin. Okay, so when you output, you know, you may not have thought about this in 112, but what happens when you output a one or you output a high? Okay, what happens when you output a low? Is it just zero volts and five volts? No, okay. One of them has a signal that's got a current that's going out of the output, and the other one has a, has a current that's coming back in and getting sunk into the chip itself and it actually goes to ground through the bottom transistor in the TTL format, right? So TTL is actually transistor transistor logic, okay? So this is actually what it's doing. This is the base, the collector emitter. And uh, so it says multi-emitter transistor totem pole output stage. I'll probably ask you about that, okay? So, you know, what kind of an output does the TTL have? They have them in a totem pole fashion. And we're actually going to look at the inside of a chip here shortly. So the average or typical high output is only 3.4 volts. Okay? It is not up at 5. The typical average low output is 0.3. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that's the maximum or the minimum. Right? And, it's, and it's a little bit odd because if you're talking about the bottom range here for a low level output, then you have a maximum value. And I think, I believe the maximum is 0.8. And then, you know, for the high level, you have a minimum value that's considered high. So just that terminology of having a high level that has a minimum and a low level that has a maximum, 
okay? So just, you know, watch the terminology there. So here's what one looks like. So this is what's going on inside the box, as my mentor Henrik Nielsen used to say, um, that that's what the engineers are supposed to do, is figure out what's going on inside the box. So here's what's going on inside of a 7400 TTL chip, okay? This is one of the gates. So the 7400 is a two input NAND gate, right? So we all remember what a NAND gate does. It's essentially an AND, right? So both inputs have to be high for the output to be high. Uh, but then we take that output and we negate it with the NAND, all right? With the N part of it, the NOT. So it's an AND function and then you invert the output, essentially. That's what a NAND gate is. So we've got our two inputs here. Notice we've got a couple of diodes. Um, and then we have one, two, three, four transistors, right? That's all, and a couple of resistors. So this is actually what comprises a gate, okay? Uh, it's just resistors and transistors in here and, uh, and, and a couple of diodes on the inputs to make sure that there's, there are low as, lows and highs, okay? Um, so, uh, again, typically, you know, in the previous slide, it said that the low output is typically 0.3. Here it says 0.2. Okay, you know, it's, it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like that. Uh, you'll actually find that value on the data sheet for each IC chip, okay? So, here's the totem pole output, right? And we say totem pole because normally a totem pole has, you know, multiple... Um, segments on it that stack on top of each other and so that's the uh, when we say totem pole output that's what we have here all right and so we have one transistor remember I told you that if you have enough current on the base all right it will activate a short between the collector and the emitter and it will allow current to flow all right so what happens is one of these two the either the Q3 or the Q4 is on one of the two is on right because there's only two outputs and so if you have this Q3 on, all right, that means Q4 is off. That means there's no signal down here on this base. And so the signal is going to go right out the output. If you have Q3 off and you have Q4 on, that gives whatever's on this other chip that's out here by where my cursor is, that's going to sync current back through because if this one is turned on, that means there's a short between the collector and the emitter and that current has somewhere down to get to ground, and so it will actually sync that back into the chip itself. Okay, that skipped way too far down there. All right, so some terminology about the input and the output current, all right? When you look at a data sheet, you're going to see it listed as current, output high, output low. So in other words, it's the output of the chip or the gate and when it outputs, you know, what is the current when it outputs a high? What is the current when it outputs a low, right? And the same thing when it comes into the chip on the inputs. You know, the low level input current. What does a low on the input look like? What does a high on the input look like, okay? So, um, like I said, it's just, uh, you, you want to start to uh, especially read through chapter 9, and, uh, and, and you may have to read this stuff a couple times just to uh, let it sink in, okay? Because this is a little bit different terminology because we're talking about highs and lows, right? But we're talking about it both for the input and for the output. We're not talking about one or the other. So this term you're going to have to know definitely for the quiz and also for the exam, uh, and that is fan out. And that says... Uh, you know, you can't get, you, you can't just exponentially take as much current from a source as you want. And that goes for if you're talking about a DC power source or an AC power source or um, if you're talking about the output of a gate, right? There's only so much current available. And for those of you who've had 111 before and uh, know what happens when this current reaches the node, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different places that it can go. Okay? If you go beyond ten, there's not enough for it to register a high anywhere. And so they all look like they have low on there because you're asking, um, there, there are too many inputs connected to this output. Okay? So I like, this is one of the things I really like about the Kleitz book, is that when he shows you a picture like this, you can see that the current is an output high. So 
this is outputting a high to all of these inputs. And so they should all be accepted as a high on every single gate input that you see here. And that's this um, I sub IH. So you have to say, if this is going to output a high, then these all, you know, if you add all of these currents together, because KCL, right, Kirchhoff's current law, all the currents coming into node have to equal all the currents leaving the node. So, you know, you've got 10 currents here. Those 10 currents have to add up to no more than this output high current, okay? Otherwise, if that's the case, you know, it, it's not going to meet this minimum threshold for a high current, and they're all going to look like a low, even though they should all be a high, okay? So it says fan out is the number of gate inputs that the same subfamily can that a single output can drive. And for TTL chips, that is 10 gates. You can source up to 10 gates with one output with TTL chips. Okay. So here we go. If you have an output low, okay, uh, that's actually where you're going to come sync back in through the chip. All right. So it says example of TTL gate syncing input currents from two gate inputs using logic symbols. So here we have a couple of NAND gates. And uh, so the author just tied each one of these inputs high just to show you what would happen here. And so, you know, again, these inputs to these two gates are the result of this output, right? So I just showed you what happens if the output is high, right? It goes out of, in, you know, it goes through that top, a Q3 transistor and comes out the output and then it gets divvied up uh, depending on how many inputs there are, right? So if you have an output low out of a TTL chip, it's actually going to sync back through uh, that bottom Q4 chip or uh, transistor, excuse me. Q3 is off right now, Q4 is on. And so it's actually going to pull from this input on this gate and this gate, and it's going to draw 1.6 milliamps out um, back through here. Okay, now you can see this happens to be a power of 10, right? So it, you could have up to 10 gates connected before you exceed this, all right? And so that's bad news. If you, if you sink more current back in than, it, than it's allowed to have, you could over... Uh, you could overwrite it. You could you could blow out that bottom transistor, okay? Uh, and so that's the maximum. So you can only have up to 10. So so here you have the problem of if you have more than 10 when you're trying to output a high, um, you have the problem that you might have a low on everything because there's not enough to drive it. Whereas, you know, here you have a maximum of 16 milliamps that can come back, okay? And so here we go. Uh, so this is one of the gate inputs. This, I, I really, really like how he does this here. So, you know, this is referencing the previous slide here. We have gate one, gate two, gate three. Okay. Here's gate one. Here's gate two. Here's gate three. These are the inputs. And this is the output from that other gate, right? Right here. So in that scenario, as I said, if you're going to output, and I'm, I'm doing air quotes here, output a low, what you're actually doing is you're pulling from those inputs, from those transistors, and drawing that current down through this bottom transistor, which is on, by the way, you can see here, and, and puts it down into um, uh, ground, all right? Now, just the opposite happens if you have an output high, all right? If you have an output high, the bottom transistor is turned off, and here's gate two and gate three input, okay? It's actually gonna draw a current from this five volt node up here, and it's gonna short between the collector and the emitter right here, because this one is turned on, and it's actually gonna source out. Okay, now right now it only has to source out 80 microamps because um, there's only two gates connected, and you can see that it's 400, or I'm sorry, it's 40. The maximum out of here is 400. That's why, you know, you can only do up to 10. It's 400, and these each draw 40 to drive them, okay? So, again, this is the, the same thing looking at, um, you know, and you can see here the difference. Uh, if you're pulling the current from the input, it's a negative, while this is an output low. And here, 
this is a negative uh, current coming out of the gate, which I know is, is kind of backwards, and then it's a positive on the input here, okay? Uh, and so the negative just means that the current is, 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 uh, is leaving, okay? Same thing for this over here. I know that's confusing for students sometimes, but um, the negative just means that they're, they're indicating that it's leaving whatever connection that they're on, right? And so here it's coming into the node, here it's leaving, and here it's leaving. For this one, here it's leaving the node, and here it's coming in, and it's coming in, okay? So just wanted to point that out too, but I, these four slides, uh, man, they're just, I think they're really, really solid in showing you how, you know, an output actually works out of these chips. And so, you know, I would, uh, I would definitely throw these numbers on your notes because um, this has, you know, pretty much all of that type of information on there. Um, so, you know, low level input current, um, you know, negative 1.6 milliamps uh, because it's sinking back in through the chip. And then the high level input current is 40 microamps because it's coming into the gate. And... Uh, for the low level output, you have 16 milliamps and uh, high level output, which is leaving. And so that's why it's negative 400. Okay. And, you know, that can be higher for some and you can drive more gates, but you have to pay for it. We're talking about what does the standard TTL chip have? Okay. Uh, and so if I ask you that question, I'm not looking for the, the anomaly over here. I'm looking for this one. Okay. And, and be, be sure to include the negative there. Okay, and then again, fan out is the maximum number of gate inputs that can be driven or connected to a standard TTL gate output. Right? It says current ratings are not the amount of current, but the maximum current capability. All right. This is a um, kind of an amplitude graphical representation of the inputs and the outputs. And this is for TTL chip. So... Uh, you can see that 2.4 volts is the minimum that you need to have a high, a guaranteed high on the output. Okay, and we'll talk about what noise margins are here in a minute. Okay, so uh, it will recognize a little bit of this noise down here and still pull it in as a high. Okay, so you know, really it's recognizable from 2 to 5, but so uh, Clarence said, can you go back real quick? Yes, right here. This slide. So I'm just, I'm, I'm pulled back to this slide real quick in case you want to take a few more notes on this. Okay. Well, yeah, so this is, this is challenging what you may have thought about, or maybe you didn't even get that far to think about how the chip actually works, right? If, if I say the, the output is high, you go, okay, the output's high, and, and that's that. So, um, you know, what it's actually doing is it's either sinking or sourcing current out, okay? And, uh, you know, if it's sourcing out, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look like a negative sign because, as you see here, it's leaving the gate. Uh, and if it's positive, that means it's coming into the node, all right? And I say the node because I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of using 111 terminology, but really, you know, it's the input or the output of a gate. So leaving the gate or entering a gate, okay? All right. And uh, if you need to go back to that clearance, you can. Because um, uh, remember, as soon as we're done here, you can go back and, and watch it immediately. So if you need to take a few more notes on that, okay? So, again, a guaranteed high is between 2.4 and 5 volts, right? A guaranteed low is between 0 and 0 0.4 volts, okay? So, um, you know, this is, it says the output high minimum is 2.4, and so, you know, uh, and then the input high is 2, all right? The input low, 0 0.8 volts, and the output low, 0.4. So like it says here, 2 volts to 5 volts will look like a 1 on the input. Um, 0 to 0.8 volts will look like a 0. And this is up for grabs. This is that region that the logic probe would call a floating condition. 
all right? And so more than likely, if this is happening, that your chip is bad. And this is what a logic probe will detect. So if you remember back from 112 when we talked about that, if you use a logic probe, it's got three indicator lights on it, typically. One to let you know if it's a definite low, one to let you know if it's a definite high, and then you also have this other um, light that is for if it's a floating condition where it's not a high it's not a low it's somewhere floating out here in the middle now some logic probes either do a the light turns off if you just have one light the light either turns off for a low it'll turn on for a high and then if it's faintly glowing right then that's in this uncertain region here it's kind of like when an led um, starts to die out in one of my daughter's um, frozen uh, Disney things that she got um, where you have to keep putting batteries in it and then it gets left on in the corner uh, and, the, and you know um, but anyway you can see as the battery starts to die that the lights get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer so really that's kind of what's happening here is there's not enough voltage to make that light bright in the logic probe and so it's only being driven by you know maybe one or 1 1.5 volts and so that's in that floating region um, where you essentially have uh, determined that the gate is bad, that particular gate. And as we saw in 112, it doesn't mean that every gate on that chip is bad. It just means that that one gate on that IC chip is bad. You still may be able to use the other three or five or however many you have. So let's talk about the noise margin. So it just says the noise margin is the difference between the high level voltages and the low level voltages. Okay, that's all it means. So you know, you can see that the minimum for uh, an output high is 2.4. The minimum for an input high, it will accept all the way down to 2, okay? And so this is a recognizable high-level input. This is a high-level output. And so that 0.4 volts difference is called the noise margin, okay? Um, so it says here, the input to a standard TTL gate will accept any level between 0 and 0 0.8 as a low level. Therefore, the 0.3 volts of noise is acceptable. So you may have a little bit of static on the line, right? Um, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit. That's why you use error checking. You know, we talked about uh, comparators. We talked about, um, you know, some other ways that we can use logic gates to determine error, right? Um, And there you go. It, you know, Kleitz has a lot of these tables in the book that he pulls directly from the um, uh, data sheets for each one of these chips. And uh, so, you know, here's the typical, what's the average, and then here's the minimum for the inputs and the, out, out, the, inputs and the outputs and um, uh, for the high and for the low, okay? And then here's the noise margin. So this is a nice little chart to have too. So, you know, especially this one, and uh, this one, I would, I would take notes on all of these, all three of these, okay? Um, this one, this one, and this one, okay? So I think there's a lot of good information there, and I would really spend a lot of time in that part of the book just, you know, uh, reading how he explains how these work, okay? Uh, let's see here. So this is actually a 7400 chip data sheet which is a NAND gate you know there's there's four um, input NAND gates on here and um, there's four two input NAND gates on here right and so you see the pinout we're familiar with pinouts from 112 okay so it tells you uh, hey that's okay Josh um, so inputs are on one and two and then the output is on three on that first gate so that's what I'm saying where you have more than one gate on the same chip here and uh, so if this one goes bad, you should still be able to use the other three, okay, unless you've just fried the chip. Like a couple times I've had students connect the voltage backwards and blow a hole through the middle of the chip. And uh, when you do something like that, there's not going to be anything that's left over that you can use on the rest of the chip. So, uh, but if it's just a gate that goes bad, you have a bad transistor that gets burnt or something, you still should be able to use the other ones. So the other things you'll find on here on the data sheet are the, like the IEEE logic symbols um, and then all of the different ratings. Here's all the different types of packages. You could get it um, in SO or you could get the DIP 
packages, which is the dual inline packages, which is what you see here. Here's the function table. We would call this the truth table, but this is, they're saying if it's low, 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 high, high, low, uh, high, high. And uh, you can see here that the NAND gate output follows. So they actually put the truth table in the data sheet for each gate, okay? You can see here, here's the propagation delay. Here is the uh, typical supply current. Now for the, for the standard 7400, um, it is nine seconds propagation delay. And uh, we're gonna talk more about propagation delay. We're gonna talk about setup time, hold time, all that good stuff. You can see the difference between the 74S00 and the 7400, one of them's you know, one third of the time. So the S series has a much, much higher, uh, I'm sorry, a much, much lower um, uh, switching time as opposed to the 7400. It's, it's uh, you know, 66 times faster, or actually, I guess you would say 300 times faster, right? Because it's three nanoseconds instead of nine. So that's what I'm saying. You can fine tune which one of these you want to buy um, based on their characteristics. Now, look what happens when you do that, though, right? So it looks here to be about, oh, geez, I'm going to have to zoom into that, uh, 8 milliamps, okay? 8 milliamps for, let me make sure that didn't go out of screen. Okay, we're good still. 8 milliamps to have it do a, a 9 nanosecond propagation delay. And here's where the cost comes in, right? It now draws 15 milliamps to make that happen. So that's double the current that's required here. So if that's something that uh, is unacceptable, then you would have to buy a different type, okay? Uh, now this one, look at the difference between the 7400 and the 74 LS. The LS and, you know, the propagation delay is about the same. If I, if I uh, zoom in there, 9 seconds versus 9.5 nanoseconds. But look at the power consumption difference. You know, this one is roughly uh, uh, a quarter. It's, it's a little over a quarter um, of what this, or a little under a quarter, I'm sorry, of, of 8 milliamps. So it consumes a whole lot less power and does about the same uh, speed. So, you know, those are the kind of things that, that, that uh, digital designers look for when they go to design something, okay? And we also have the voltage ratings. These are the absolute do not exceed or you will burn this chip up uh, ratings, right? And it uh, gives you what all those specifications are. Here we come down to what we've been talking about, which is the voltage levels for the inputs and also for the outputs for, and also for the currents. Um, here you can see what the operating voltage is. We always just took it up to five volts. Uh, but you can also, you know, you can go a little bit higher, you can go a little bit lower, but you cannot exceed uh, what the maximum is, right? So the, so the nominal, what we typically use is just 5 volts for everything. However, it will work all the way down to 4.75 volts, right, and up to 5.25. Um, but that's why we try to keep it right in the middle of that range at 5, okay? And again, this just is just uh, uh, restating what we talked about in the previous slides um, about the different voltage levels, about the different current levels. And this is also really great down here. It's got, it's got the pulse definition, okay? So it shows you what happens when you go from a high to a low. Notice this is not a nice, sharp, 90-degree turn, is it, okay? Because as we know, if you were to zoom in close enough, over time, right, it takes time to go from 5 volts and then go down to 0 volts. It takes time to discharge, okay? Um, and so it doesn't happen immediately. So there's a period of time where it has to transition from high to low, all right? Uh, and it, there's also a period of time it takes for it to transition from a low to a high, Okay, and you can see the pulse width here. Uh, the time from low to high uh, for the 7400 is seven nanoseconds, and the time from high to low is seven nanoseconds. So no matter how long, no matter if you're going from high to low or low to high on this chip for the 7400, it's seven nanoseconds to get from high to low or seven nanoseconds to get from low to high. And you may be thinking to yourself, nanoseconds, that's one billionth of a second, yes. Uh, that's what we're talking about. So we are down in the weeds here, you know, talking about 
the difference between nine nanoseconds versus three nanoseconds. All right. There's very few other classes where we're down here in this, uh, you know, in this quick of a of a speed range here. But that's what we're doing. Okay. Uh, you can see the 74S, the, the time it takes to go from low to high is only 2.5. That is light years away from that 7 nanoseconds. Okay, same thing for the uh, high to low transition on the 74S. All right. And, um, you know, the different voltage uh, characteristics, input, uh, output voltage, input, current. Um, and then it also has down here the waveform right and it tells you you know what's the propagation from high to low from you know from the front to the back and then they also test through all of these they you know when they make a million of something they'll take however many thousand samples and they'll run these same signals and do a testing of a certain percentage of the final ones that they make uh, and that's how they come up with these numbers okay and that's how they come up with these uh, graphs and so you know you can see here the change from the input, when the input changes, to make a change on the output, here is the propagation delay, all right? And you can see here, uh, the, the, the propagation delay specs, um, if I zoom in here, so this is the low to high and then also the high to low, okay? So this is in your book, if you want a better picture of this, this is just the slide, but in your book, this is, this is somewhere in there. I don't know if it's in the chapter or at the end of the book in like the near the glossary or, or whatever. Um, but anyway, here's the two different propagation delays. So, so in other words, when there's a change on the input, how long does it take the output to change? That's the propagation delay. Okay. So for low to high, it's 22 nanoseconds from input to output. Um, and you can see the difference between that and the S74S, right? That is getting on with the program, 4.5 nanoseconds. Um, and then from the high to low transition, uh, it's a little bit quicker at 15. And uh, this one's still at 15, but this one's down here to 5. So obviously, the S is far superior on all things speed. And as we saw, the reason why you would choose an LS is because of the power consumption factor. And if you just wanted a NAND gate, you would just buy the 7400 series. Okay. Let me back out of that into the proper... Uh, there we go. So uh, we can also say how long does it take for it to transition from low to high? The rise time, that's measured from 10 to 90% of the level. The fall time is also from 90% down to 10% of the level. Okay. And then we'll take a look at the propagation delay. So the input changes. How long does it take for the output to change? Right? And we just talked about that. That's the low to high, T sub PLH or T sub PHL. What's the propagation delay from when it goes from low to high versus what's the propagation delay when it goes from high to low? Here, one of them is 12 nanoseconds and the other one is 20 nanoseconds. Okay. Uh, now, I don't believe I have you do any of these. Um, if I did, it would just be a simple you know, plug and chug like you see here. Um, because all you're doing is taking the average of those two. So it says, um, you know, if you were going to compute what the power dissipation was for the IC, power supply terminals, um, it says assume 50% duty cycle. That just means that, you know, half the time it's on, half the time it's off. And, uh, and then uh, the power dissipation is voltage times current, right? Uh, the average, right? That's, it's ICC sub AV. So... Um, it says the total supply current for a 7402 NOR is given as uh, 14 uh, milliamps, and that is for low, and then the, the high is 8 milliamps. It says determine the power dissipation of the IC, and we assumed a 50% duty cycle, so half the time it's going to be um, 8, and half the time it's going to be 14. So if we average the two of them together, we can take five volts times whatever that average is, and then in this case, we come up with 55 milliwatts of power consumption, okay? So if I ask you to do that, it's not gonna be any more difficult than what you see right here, okay? So let's talk about open collector outputs, right? In the totem pole connection on the output, what we do is we remove Q3, 
okay? So it can sink current, but it no longer can source current because that's gone away. So how do we solve that, all right? Um, if we only have the one transistor in the bottom. It says to get a TTL open collector output or a CMOS open drain output, same thing, right? In, uh, in CMOS, we'll find out that it's a, a gate and a drain instead of a, uh, well, uh, instead of a base and a collector and emitter, right? So an open collector output, um, to produce a high, you need to put on a pull-up resistor, right? Guarantee you that's going to be on a quiz and on the exam. Pull-up resistor, if you have an open collector output, to make it high. So again, when we're sourcing, that means that it's low, right? I'm sorry, if we're sinking, that means that it's low. So we can sink back into here if it's a low output, right? But if we need a high, uh, if this one is turned off, what we do is we have a, uh, a pull-up resistor, right? And the pull-up resistor is connected to 5 volts, okay? So if this thing is turned off, uh, if you remember, if this doesn't have anywhere to go, there's no voltage drop here. So this resistor becomes a piece of wire, and that's where you get this high on here because the 5 volts has nowhere to go. Now, when you open up that bottom transistor, now you have a voltage drop, and since this is a short, you have a way for that current to get down to ground, right? So that will not affect the low. But, um, so uh, that's this one up here, sorry. Um, when you have a voltage drop across it and you have zero volts, okay? Because that's gonna, uh, it has the ability to sink that current and you're gonna have to have that voltage drop here. Um, now down here, while this is off, you know, if I just put my cursor there, now the current has nowhere to go. And so you remember, this is kind of like an open circuit. If you have an open cir series circuit, you get the full voltage of the source um, on whatever terminals that you're measuring from, right? On that open. And so you would get 5 volts here, you get 5 volts here, 5 volts here, and 5 volts here. Okay, so that's how we get a high if we just have an open collector. Um, so you may have noticed that whenever you do a BDF file in Cordis, you sometimes get like, your, 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 your thing compiled, there was no errors, but there was 27 warnings, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, how, how can I have that many warnings? And I've always told you before, if you've had me, that you shouldn't worry about the warnings. All you have to care about is the error, okay? Because the error uh, means that it will not compile and it will not download. So you have to fix that before you do anything. So where you can get more fine-tuned is that, um, you know, we need to do something with the unused inputs and outputs, okay, and unused gates for that matter. It says, open inputs degrade noise immunity. So if you have those open to, uh, you know, whatever noise, electromagnetic noise is in the area or, you know, close to the board, that's a way that that could get in there and potentially harm that device, okay? So um, it says if you have an AND, it says, and and NAND gates, tie your inputs high um, and tie your gates high. And uh, it says if you have an OR and an, or a NOR, uh, then you tie your inputs to ground. And it says unused gates, you force the outputs so that they're always high. That way, if it's always high, you, you know, you're not going to get a, um, uh, it, if you have any noise, it's already going to be high. So if it goes from, you know, 3.4 volts and you get a little bit of noise on there and now it's 3.9, well, you're still at a high. Whereas if you are at a low of 0.4 volts and you get, um, you know, let's say 0.7 volts of noise on there, now you're above that, that maximum level uh, and it becomes a floating and you could have un, unstable um, um, operation, okay? So these are the kind of things that uh, if you wanted to take it a step further, this is the kind of stuff that you should do when you actually physically wire something up, okay? But that's the, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, when you are getting those warnings, this is the kind of stuff that, the, that it's looking at. And that's why it's just a warning because they know that, okay, you're just trying to, um, you know, work through this, you know, at the, at the academic level and we know that you may not have all of this stuff down, but we want to let you know that you should probably do some with these at some point, right? Uh, but we're going to let you go ahead and compile this and then run it. 
Oh, that just skipped a bunch, didn't it? Okay, so the H series, uh, if you see at 74H00, the H means that it's half the propagation delay, but here's the, here's the trade-off. It's double the power consumption, okay? The L series is just the opposite. You get half the power consumption, but now it takes twice as long to uh, convert an imp, you know, when, when an input changes to see it on the output, okay? So if speed is not, is not as important, and uh, you want to worry about how much power you're using, then you would use the L series, okay? It says in both cases, the speed power product remained about the same. So we have this idea called the speed power product, and that's kind of what I was getting at at the very, very front of this uh, lecture, okay? So if you take the propagation delay times the speed, you get some number. And so what you try to do is you try to make that number as small as possible because you want the, the shortest propagation delay and you want the least amount of power consumption. So a very, very small speed power product is desirable, okay? But you can see here they're saying, you know, you're getting twice in half and then you're also getting twice in half here. And so, you know, that speed power product is about the same. It says, in most cases, both have been replaced by shot key TTLs and CMOS. Okay, so what is a shot key TTL? So the main speed limitation of a standard TTL is due to its capacitive charge in the transistor base. Okay, the charge is stored when the transistor is in what we call saturated. Okay, so what the TT, what the um, um, the shot key series does is it adds a shot key diode between the base and the collector. Okay, um, like you you can see here. And so this allows it to, you know, you don't want that charge to store because that's what takes it a long time to get from a high to a low is you have to let that high um, uh, find its way to ground somewhere. You got to get rid of it. So when it's saturated like that, you have a charge on there that you have to get rid of before it'll transition to a low. So this helps prevent that from happening. So the LS, we talked about this earlier, the power consumption is significantly reduced um, and it says the speed power product, one-third of the 74S series and one-fifth of the standard uh, 7400 series, okay? And then the low power shot key, this is even more expensive, propagation dropped from 9 to 4 nanoseconds and the power dissipation from 2 to 1 milliwatt per gate. Uh, so in that triangle, I said there's always a cost, and so these are more expensive because you're getting both of those. So if you're getting both a propagation delay reduction and a power dissipation reduction, you're paying more money. That's the trade-off, okay? And if speed is the name of the game, then you would get the F-series, right? Propagation lowered to under three nanoseconds. That is quick, right? Now we're, now we're flirting down there with uh, hundreds of uh, picoseconds. Um, and then also the device size is very, very, very small because you don't need very much power to get through those smaller transistors. Now let's talk about the CMOS. So instead of using BJTs, they use MOSFETs, or we call them MOSFETs. And MOSFET uh, stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistors. Um, and so you may have heard somebody say, yeah, it's, got, it's a MOSFET preamp or whatever. That just means that it's using MOSFET transistors, all right? So it says here, a high input impedance and a low power dissipation. And that's typically why people like them, because they have a low power dissipation, okay? And I'm not going to get into the structure of these. Um, you know, like here's the, here's the BJT, uh, you know, has a base, and then the collector and the emitter um, are, are shorted. And here you have the gate and then the drain to the sink, okay? Um, so it's the same, or I'm sorry, drain to the source. Uh, so the gate is the input, and then you have, uh, you still have this N and NPN orientation. You just have a substrate, and you have a little bit of um, um, an, an induced N channel that moves across the P uh, in this configuration. So it's a little bit different in how it works. You will probably take other classes that go more into the structure of the transistor and how it works. This is not an, an analog class, okay? But just kind of introducing, it's, it's, you can just kind of think about it the same way. It just has lower power dissipation than the BJT transistor, okay? Um, it 
And these are just, they're showing the different configurations of the, of the gates here. You can see that they kind of stack them uh, like in this one, they have the Q3 and the Q4 of the top here. Here they've got Q3 and they've got Q4. Um, and then they've got these two over here to the side. So it just depends on their orientation. Okay. Here's the biggest problem with CMOS devices. They are very, very sensitive to electrostatic discharge. All right. So when we work with these in lab, I make everyone touch something metal before they try to pick up one of these CMOS devices because otherwise, just picking one up like if you happen to, to um, you know, uh, have generated a little bit of charge on your body when you go to pick one up and you shock it, uh, you'll actually short it out and it's no good anymore, right? They're very, very sensitive. So um, if it's something you do for a living, you would have a wrist strap on all day so that you wouldn't have to worry about that. Um, it's the same concept like, you know, coming out of my office down the hall when I go to make a copy, the, the printer door shocks me every single time. It's just, it's like, uh, gosh, uh, I think it's an office space where, where that happens, right? You know, like every time he knows the thing is going to shock him. But there's a little metal um, grounding strip right next to it. And I think it's actually there for, to protect the corner because it's right around a corner. So I think it's trying to protect the corner of the building there in case somebody bumps it. But I always touch that. And every time I touch it and discharge myself, uh, then it doesn't shock me when I when I grab it. So uh, that's you know wearing a wrist strap or discharging the the electrostatic uh, voltage off of your body. You need to do that if you're going to work with CMOS. And you can't just you can't while they're plugged in pull them out because you can also uh, damage them that way as well. Right. So very very what I would call cantankerous. And again, the 4000 series is the base series for CMOS, just like the 7400 series is the base series for TTL. The H series is the faster one for CMOS. The C series, uh, this is the one that's pin compatible with the uh, CMOS, right? The 74C. So if your chip says 74C00, that's still a NAND gate configuration. It's just that, um, you know, now it's pin compatible with the TTL because the 4000 series, I believe, has 16 pins and the TTL series has 14 pins. And so this particular series of the CMOS has 14 pins and you can pull the TTL chip out and put this CMOS in its place. And it has all the same gates with all the same pins and, and for, for inputs and outputs. Okay, the HC100, this is what we have a lot of, or just the HC. Um, in the in the classroom, this is what we have a lot of is this HC. So speedy, less power, pin compatible, greater noise immunity, and, and temperature operating range. So um, if you just wanted to buy a better series, this is really, you know, like if I was going to go buy some chips just to play around with, um, I would probably buy the HC 100, the HC series, I mean, for CMOS. Um, but, if, but if price was an object, then I would probably just get 7,400 uh, TTL chips because I wouldn't be doing something that required less power or, or, or I, I had no need for the speed. So, uh, and then there's some other series here. I'm not going to go into those as much. Okay, so the last family we're going to talk about is the emitter coupled logic. Okay, now these things are extremely fast. But the huge trade-off here, and I do mean huge, is that they have a huge increased power dissipation, right? And so here we use differential amplifiers. We're just using our transistors in a different orientation here, okay? Um, so it's still transistor emitters. Uh, it's just we're, we're using, I think we only use three of them in all of these cases. Uh, but anyway, it's the, same, it's the same type of thing where we're either going through one side or the other for a high or um, for a low. Okay. Now, some of the newer ones, um, you know, integrated injection logic. You can you can research all of these. These are really really fascinating. Um, it says in all cases the goal is higher frequencies and increased density. That means a smaller footprint. You can put more stuff in a smaller package, and then you can make your gadget that much smaller, right? Uh, but obviously these cost more money. But these are really, really cool to, uh, to look into, okay? So here we go. Here's the difference. And so, like I said, when I said the ECL is a lot different, you can see here the propagation delay, 
nanoseconds. So we are down in the picosecond range, 800 picoseconds. That's how quickly the propagation delay goes from high to low. But here's the trade-off. 40 milliwatts of power to do that, all right? So it's got a, it still doesn't have a very bad speed power product. Um, it's just that it has a humongous power dissipation. And so if you're worried about your battery being drained too fast, you're not gonna use these. And so these are not very common at all, all right? But you can't get this quick of a uh, propagation delay any other way, unless you use one of these um, newer technologies, okay? Um, so anyway, you know, there you see the speed power product. It's in picowatt seconds, you know, if that means anything. But um, really, it's just the, it's the power times the propagation delay. That's all they're doing. And here we go. And if you wanted to look at them versus, you know, propagation delay on one uh, uh, axis of the grass and then power consumption in the other, you can kind of see how the speed power product compares. And you can see that the power over here uh, you know, 40 watts, there's nobody even close. You know, the 74S series, remember, um, it was much quicker, but the trade-off was it had more power consumption. And this one takes that even further, right? It, it has double the power consumption of the S series. So, and then another little chart that kind of uh, hints on the same thing, all right? Now, in terms of interfacing, we are going to touch on this next time, okay? So, uh, that is as far as we are going to take this part of chapter nine and we will start there next time and uh, then we will finish up chapter nine and then we will start talking about chapter 10. Okay, so thank everybody for coming and uh, you are all free to go. If you want to come back and watch this a second time, again, I'm going to go in either tonight or uh, maybe sometime tomorrow and come in and timestamp this. So we break up the different uh, topics in the discussion and you can easily get back to a certain segment, okay? So if nobody has any other questions, uh, I will talk to you all later.